us this evening, and I feel very honored to have uh, both Professor Kevin Starr uh, and his wife, Sheila Gordon Starr, here this evening. Kevin Starr is currently professor of the School of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Southern California. He is a professor, author, one-time journalist, city librarian, whose list of achievements might make you suspect he is no mere mortal. His degrees are from the University of San Francisco and Harvard University, along with a Master of Library Science from UC Berkeley. Not only has he studied at these distinguished institutions, he has also taught at all of them and others equally distinguished, in addition to being a visiting scholar and media fellow, and I have to ask him later on what that means, at Hoover Institution. A prolific writer, Professor Starr's most stupendous achievement, uh, in my opinion, are the three volumes he has written on California history, Americans and the California Dream, 1850 to 1915, Inventing the Dream, California through the Progressive Era, and Material Dreams, Southern California through the 1920s. These are magnificent books. Uh, most instructive, I think, that you'll ever read on the California experience because they give you conceptual tools to analyze uh, that experience. Um, the one thing that Professor Starr shares with the other lecturers is the determination to avoid perceiving California from the vantage point of contemporary cliche and stereotype. I want to apologize for that stereotype about the Southern California the real estate developer. Uh, I'm working on that one. Uh, as Gerald Haslam has noticed, California is to the United States what the United States is to the world. And Americans have always viewed California, uh, or to Americans, uh, California has been always a symbol of redefining themselves, of acquiring new values and, and ways of living. Kevin Starr has noted that Californians define themselves through the land and that agriculture, not sport or tourism or mountaineering, constitute the most primary and workaday relationship of the Californian to the land. He discusses the play of fable, counter fable, and describes the California experience as a rhythm of expectation and disappointment, ideality, and harsh fact. He uh, actually encourages everyone to take a look at California history and uh, considers it a cultural failing to, uh, that it can be a cultural failing to internalize uh, some understanding of its past tragedies, that unless we fail to internalize some understanding of its past tragedies and past ideals, um, that we will be unable to focus upon the promise and dangers of the present. Here to speak for himself on the poetry and moral drama of our social experience is Ken Stone. <coughs> Thank you, Lillian. I don't think you should apologize uh, for your designation of um, Southern Californians as uh, developers. Some, as a cliche, you shouldn't designate that a cliche. Some cliches contain a great bit of truth to it, and I think that one does. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, especially to be put in the mood by that very eloquent uh, visual show, evoking the range and complexity, poetic beauty of this uh, Central California landscape. My assignment from Lillian uh, is to conclude this stunning series uh, on this, its ninth installment, with a summary statement, with a summary statement, and a look into the future. Like Johnny Carson playing the great Karnak, I am asked to don my turban and gaze into the crystal ball. First of all, what I see most clearly is the success of this series. It will prove a point of departure and, and a point of reference for historians and social critics in the time to come. Here at long last, a future historian of California might justifiably write, the Central Valley, the Great Central Valley, Central California, the Other California, the Third California, call it what you will, assembled the materials of its identity and coaxed itself onto a higher plane of consciousness. Even more significantly, that higher plane of consciousness passed beyond the mere accumulation of statistics. Although having watched all uh, eight videotapes, I'm, I'm awash, I'm sh as I'm sure you are, in, in statistics. But, but, but we went beyond in this series the mere accumulation of statistics. 
as revealing as those statistics might be, and certainly we avoided naive boosterism in favor of what the philosopher George Santayana called the tragic sense of life. The knowledge that all our optimisms are conditioned by great perils and the mistakes and misbehaviors inevitable to the human condition. Indeed, watching some of the speakers on videotape in preparation for this talk, I was sometimes tempted to think that some of the speakers went beyond the tragic sense of life, that they became, out of the best of motivations, similar to those whom Dante describes as willingly loving the darkness, of wandering in a Stygian labyrinth of statistics whose only interpretation is gloom, gloom, gloom. A few years ago, in writing the text and organizing the format for a book of aerial photographs by Reg Morrison, subsequently published as Over California by Collins Publishers, I found myself, like Gerald Haslam, deeply dissatisfied with the class division of California into North and South. At the time, I made a five-fold division of California, which I today would increase to six. These six divisions are unified by geography, flora and fauna, and human history. They include California del Sur, from the Mexican border to northern Ventura County. The Central Coast, from Santa Barbara to Monterey. El Dorado, the classic gold rush country fanning out from San Francisco, including Sacramento and the mother load as far as Lake Tahoe. The natural north, divided into the Redwood Empire and the Modoc Plateau. The invented garden, which is to say the Central Valley. And the garden wall, which includes the Sierra Nevada and both the Mojave and Colorado deserts. Each of these divisions represents not only a geomorphic province, but an orderly progression of history in its Euro-American phases. European California began in San Diego in 1769. It then leapt northward to Santa Barbara and Monterey, twin capitals of the Central Coast. The gold rush created San Francisco, Sacramento, the cities and towns of the Mother Lode and adjacent agricultural hinterlands. The post-gold rush era saw the gradual peopling of the natural north. The great Central Valley, after much delay, began to emerge in the late 19th and 20th centuries. And of course, the garden wall, mountain, and desert remain relatively undeveloped by both circumstance and today by active social choice. The invented garden. This is how I perceive the great Central Valley. The Latin verb invenire means to come upon, to discover that which is already there. Its English derivative invent suggests the creation of a new identity. The concept of the invented garden includes both notions. The garden was always there in the interior of California, but it also had to be invented through irrigation projects of heroic magnitude. The landscape of the invented garden is not intimate. It is heroic, even abstract. Interstate 80 and 5 move through landscapes that extend in every direction towards distant mountain ranges. And yet the signs of irrigation and agriculture are everywhere. Canals, silos, orchards, and planted fields as far as the eye can see, engendering an atmosphere of remote human power as if an absent race of giants had planted this great garden, then stole away into the mountains. <coughs> Since my assignment is to summarize as well as prognosticate, let me begin with the first lecture of the series, Gerald Haslam proved yet another time, as if proof were necessary,
that he is the premier interpreter of Central California, and himself, as a writer, as a poet, a social commentator, a literary critic, is one of the master spirits of California in our time. More than a hundred years ago, the California-born philosopher Josiah Royce wrote a pioneering history of California because, in Royce's opinion, California exemplified the American character. In his approach to the great Central Valley, Gerald Haslam goes even further. For Haslam, the great Central Valley represents what the medievals would call the plenum mundi, the fullness of the world. Nay more, for Haslam, the great Central Valley offers a profound and dynamic probe, an axis of approach, a metaphor into the human condition itself. Breathtakingly, Haslam began in the land the physical fact of California, which is where all great commentators on this state begin, must begin, their inquiries. He evoked the great Central Valley in its ancient existence as a vast inland sea, 2,100 miles of shoreline and adjacent wetlands from which egrets hunted horned toads in the desert not far away. He suggested the time when it was a great grassland, a vast Serengeti plain teeming with perennial bunch grass, which has now but all disappeared. He evoked the valley as the great Pacific flyway, the migration corridor north and south for birds of every description, which up until recent experience darkened the daylight in their passage. He made us see the great herds of elk extending as far as the eye could see into the distance and the majesty of a solitary grizzly raised to its full height. The great Central Valley has them suggested 430 miles long, 50 to 75 miles wide, is now the most altered open landscape on the planet. It is also the most productive, unnatural landscape in the world. Fully a quarter of all the food consumed in the United States each year is produced here. William Preston, professor of geography at the California Polytechnic University at San Luis Obispo, described the process whereby the transformation of the great Central Valley came about. Most importantly, to my way of thinking, Professor Preston suggested two very salient aspects of this transformation. In older societies, he noted, technology and environment reach a point of balance, hence stasis, hence stability. There are agricultural regions in Europe, Professor Preston noted, which have been under continuous cultivation for more than a thousand years. In the great Central Valley, by contrast, technology seems to have no limits, seem to have no limits. We're certainly we're living in a time today where the limitations become dramatically apparent. Technology expanded itself, transmogrified itself, improved itself restlessly, relentlessly in the great Central Valley, the early irrigation districts, the Fresno scraper, the tractor, dams and canals without number, culminating in the great Central Valley projects, railroad tracks, refrigerated rail cars, highways, interstates, air conditioning, let us not forget this last air conditioning, for without it, the present urbanization and suburbanization of the great Central Valley would not have occurred. It was almost as if technology had a mind of its own and was making every effort to dominate a region almost too vast to be, to be contemplated, almost too heroically resistant to be subdued. With true intellectual elegance, Professor Preston also made reference to the role of religion in the altering and reshaping of the great Central Valley. By this, he did not mean, I presume, one or another sectarian creed, but the full force of religion as a shaping element in human culture and civilization. Let me for a moment, push Professor Preston's point of view even further. 
He made reference, remember, to the civilized uh, communities imposed on the map in ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt at the very dawn of urban life some 5,000 plus years ago. From the earliest irrigation projects, historians tell us, came the capacity for social cooperation which made urban life possible. Cooperative irrigation also further redefined and refined the concept of a shared common good a philosophy of social life which came forward to structure and anchor religious mythologies and creeds. Certainly California, the great Central Valley most dramatically, has been shaped by the power of this ancient metaphor. The irrigation history of our state is peopled by figures such as William Hammond Hall, and William Ellsworth Smythe, for whom the work of irrigation and reclamation constituted nothing less than the creation of civilization itself. This creation of a new socio-economy through irrigation, moreover, was not just a matter of economic self-interest, as important as such self-interest might be, even despite itself, despite the greed and the double-dealing it was in part motivated and empowered by cultural imperatives, which in their scope and power could be compared only to the creation of comparable civilizations in China, Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Valley of the Po. From this perspective, the creation of the Great Central Valley, which is to say the creation of the invented garden of Central California, is an accomplishment not just of California history, or American history, or even hemispheric history. It is an accomplishment of world civilization, a fact I wish to return to when we peer forward into the 21st century. Ah, yes, Malcolm Margolin and Professor Sally M. Miller caution us in their subsequent lectures, this creation of the great Central Valley, as impressive as it might be, first of all, displaced and destroyed the valley's indigenous peoples, and secondly, it was actualized only through the back-breaking labor of generations of immigrants for whom the great Central Valley was not a cozy comparison to Breston's Egypt or Canaan, biblical land of milk and honey but brutal days beneath a scorching sun, long hours, low wages, and only a bunkhouse or a roll of blankets beneath a clump of sycamores in an arroyo to call home. The power of Malcolm Margolin's lecture is the realization we grasp from it, however mysteriously, however obscurely, its emphasis upon the simple fact, as T.S. Eliot tells us, that in the end is our beginning and in the beginning is our end. The very diversity of the indigenous peoples as Marco Margolin presents them suggests the very diversity of contemporary Central California. Indeed, the very number of native languages spoken in the valley, 80 approaching 100, reflects a similar condition in the valley's contemporary public schools. From the dawn of human habitation, the great Central Valley nurtured many peoples, Wintun and Maidu, Patwin and Miwok, the great Yokuts, and in the far north, the Yana and Yahi, to whose last survivor, Ishi, I shall eventually return, for the message of Ishi's life remains of great value, especially in the context of the postmodernist assimilation of knowledge and sociocultural identities, which Malcolm Margolin also suggested the way, that is, that the message and meaning of our indigenous peoples remain of crucial importance to the unfolding California identity, despite everything the white man did in the 19th century to eradicate the Native Americans as a people. Taken together, the lectures of Dr. Miller and Dr. James J. Rawls told the story of immigration into the Great Central Valley from the mid-19th century to the present from the Chinese in the 1870s to the fleeing Southern California suburbanites and the Southeast Asian refugees a century later. The roll call of peoples and groups that can be gleaned from these two lectures is nothing less than the roll call of human life itself. 
from the start. The great Central Valley, despite its dominant Anglo-American elites, was a cosmopolis, a world city, even more an ecumenopolis, a world city based on ecumenical diversity. Telling the story of these in-migrating peoples has emerged as the central preoccupation of California historians since the 1960s. An entire generation of California historians, now in their 40s and early 50s, began this task as graduate students and young professors in the late 1960s when the consciousness and cultural self-definition of this nation shifted dramatically to include previously neglected peoples. This effort possessed even earlier anticipatory paradigms in the self-supporting researches of Delilah Beasley of Oakland, author of the pioneering study, The Negro Trailblazers of California, published in 1919. The writing of California history in terms of its component groups, most of them minorities, righted a wrong, the worst kind of wrong, the wrong of being ignored, of not having your story merely distorted <coughs> but not having it told at all. The Anglo-American establishment of an earlier era was willing to consider the story of its native races, as historian Herbert Howe Bancroft termed them in the title of his five volume, The Native Races of the Pacific States, published in 1874, 1875, which remains, despite its flaws, a powerful testimony by means of ethnographic scholarship to the awareness of Anglo-America that other peoples had long ago settled the Pacific region. The Anglo-American establishment of an earlier era was also more than willing to tell the story of Spain and Mexico and California. Indeed, the, that story was appropriated in both serious scholarship, uh, the, Bolt, the Bancroft histories, the work of Irving Burdine Richmond, Herbert Eugene Bolton and others of the Bolton School. And it was told as well on a more popular romantic level. Charles Fletcher Lummis, George Wharton James, Helen Hunt Jackson, and all the spin-offs of the Ramona myth. Anglo-America needed what Van Wyck Brooks calls the usable past, and the story of Spain and Mexico and California was linked to the story of Anglo-California in the very land itself. On the other hand, Anglo-America did not find a comparable identification in the story of the Chinese who built its railroads and, levi and levied its delta and worked its crops, and the other minorities who followed them into the Golden State. Obviously, the wholesale shift of the academy to the left played a role in motivating younger scholars to tell, at long last, the story of minority peoples. The very exploitation of these minorities, after all, offered specific examples of a larger argument about America itself. For all the valuable work done by these historians, however, their work, especially as presented in the compressed requirements of the lecture platform, frequently tends to resemble a laundry list of grievances. Was racism a characteristic of California in the 19th and 20th century? Yes, obviously. Was there exploitation of minority labor? Yes, obviously. But was this the entire picture? If the history of minorities in the great Central Valley, indeed in California itself, was, as some scholars would have us believe, so one-sided, so gruesome, so unjust, why did they come? Why did they stay? Why do they continue to come in such great numbers? Could it be that for all its faults, California in general and the great Central Valley in particular still offered and continues to offer the chance of something better? Contented peoples do not migrate. No matter how bad it might be in California, it was worse someplace else. And that is why we all came here. I shall return to this point in a moment. Our perceptions of the pain of the past must be anchored in solid evidence. 
They must also be based on a 360 degree viewpoint, if at all possible. Take the matter of John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, probably the best known text uh, in, in American writing to relate to the Central Valley. Is it great art? Yes. Is it true to the spirit of history? As much as possible. It is, after all, an imaginative recreation of experience. Is it history, a factual record? Not really. It is art. It makes a moral and imaginative statement. But it is not true, for example, that the Dust Bowl migrants were treated by residents of the Great Central Valley with the universal hard-heartedness depicted in the Grapes of Wrath. The sudden arrival of more than 300,000 migrants within a few years, most of them settling in the Central Valley, had created a disaster in housing and health. Migrants tended to concentrate in four types of clusters, private labor camps, auto and trailer camps, shack towns, and ditch banks or roadside squatter camps. Unregulated, uninspected, private labor camps consisted in the main of one-room frame cabins in various stages of dilapidation, or tents with or without wooden floors, or chicken sheds, pump houses, barns, or other service buildings reconverted to dormitory use. It's important to remember the outreach of Central Valley residents in this period, the outreach to the migrants, the other side of the story not told in the Greats of Wrath. The plight of migrant children, for example, made the strongest impression on local educators and health officials up and down the Great Central Valley in the mid to late 1930s. Debilitated by poverty and poor nutrition, a steady diet of beans, rice, and fried dough, with next to no milk and rarely fruits or vegetables, an estimated 27% of all migrant children suffered from some form of malnutrition. While many children died from accidents or sickness, others were rescued through the intervention of local public health officials in the Great Central Valley. Public health nurse Eva Barnes, for example, visited a migrant camp in Kern County in 1932. In one cabin, she found a small girl lying on an old quilt in one corner of the room. Removing a soiled white blanket, she saw the child's entire right hip was covered with a third degree burn. Barnes arranged for the child to be brought into town and treated. In another cabin, she found a boy of 10 wrapped in blankets and an overcoat suffering from acute tonsillitis. Nurse Barnes returned later that evening with the county health officer. The physician re-examined the boy and told the parents he would not live unless he were rushed to the hospital. Laying the boy out in the back seat of his Ford, the public health doctor drove him 50 miles to the county hospital and saved his life. Principals and teachers in the counties of the San Joaquin Valley made a significant effort to persuade migrant children to attend local public schools. In Bakersfield, Kern County in 1935, public school teachers pooled their own private donations out of their meager salaries to provide migrant children food at lunchtime. While generously anxious to have their children educated, migrant parents frequently needed them in the fields as workers. Tired, hungry, chronically malnourished, ill-clothed, barefoot, and unwashed, migrant children made difficult pupils. Nearly all of them felt deeply ashamed of their appearance, in contrast to the other children who could be frequently cruel to their unkempt classmates. Rarely could migrant children finish a year or even a semester. Records from public schools in the Bakersfield area show that 486 percent of all school children transferred schools one or more times in 1935. Between July 1935 and January 1940, another, th another 352,000 migrants displaced by drought, erosion, dust storms, flooding, and foreclosures entered California, adding their number to the estimated 300,000 plus migrants already in the state. 52% of the migrants entering between 1935 and 1939 
came from Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, and Kansas, with Oklahoma in the lead. 37% of these migrants, in turn, settled in the five southern counties of the San Joaquin Valley. 17% of the migrants of the, se uh, of the second of the 1930s migrations settled in another six adjacent San Joaquin and Sacramento Valley counties, meaning, of course, that the great Central Valley absorbed the bulk of 600,000 immigrants in less than a 10-year period. Only 15% of the migrants settled in Los Angeles County, which was then the leading agricultural county in the state. The remaining 11.5% settled throughout the rest of California. Thus, the southern San Joaquin counties, Kern County especially, absorbed the bulk of this in-migration. Some districts in this region doubled in population between 1935 and 1940. I made a study, uh, which I will be publishing in a forthcoming book, The Dream Endures, California Through the Great Depression, on the tax rolls uh, of, the, of these counties during these times and the extensive details of the outreach, especially public health nurses, school educators, uh, in, uh, in trying to deal with this crisis of migration that was unexpectedly dumped on their uh, doorstep. The farming, the people of Kern, Kings, Madera, Fresno, and Tulare counties who have been bearing the brunt of this migration found that their fine local schools and county hospitals, which they had built up at heavy cost, were suddenly swamped. The farming communities built additions to their schools and hospitals. They hired additional teachers, nurses, and doctors. In Kern County, the local taxes for health, sanitation, charities, and corrections more than doubled in the 1930s, and the school taxes almost trebled in the last five years, 1935-1940, while in Kings County and Tulare County, school taxes quadrupled. The fact is, if we are to tell the story of suffering and injustice, we must also tell the whole story, and this includes the story of those who sought to assist the suffering and to right wrongs. More importantly, we must resist the temptation to define the in-migrating minorities of the Great Central Valley, be they the Chinese, the Armenians, the Jodes, the Sikhs, the Southeast Asians, the Latinos, to define them exclusively in terms of their victimhood. To do this is to indulge in a comparable act of cultural and humanistic suppression, to see a people that is strictly in terms of what has been done to them while refusing to see how they prevailed, how they enjoyed life, how they continued to energize themselves, to persist and to thrive amidst the constellations of home, family, religion, and social and cultural identities which could never be taken from them. The story of suffering and exploitation in the Great Central Valley is equally the story of those who behave well when they were in power or in positions of authority, such as the hardworking public health officials. It is also the story of those who sought to serve the public nurses and school teachers of Kern County in the Depression. More importantly, it is also the story of the promise of the good things in life, which brought people here in the first place, kept them here, kept their children and grandchildren here. At the conclusion of the long list of grievances, past and present, that, that inevitably uh, must have come, uh, had to come out in this lecture series, I found myself gratified by Professor Garrison Spasito's lecture on the epic of water in the great Central Valley, or even that of course, was clouded over with so many warnings. California in general and the Great Central Valley in particular, after all, envisioned and invented itself through water in the 19th and 20th century. When we Californians talk about water, we are talking about nothing less than the deepest fact and symbol we have in common. California envisioned itself through water. California invented itself through water. Today we are asking ourselves in far more difficult circumstances, can this envisionment, can this invention, can this self-actualization continue? Just how powerful in, his, in an historical and symbolic way the great water projects of Central California are becomes immediately evident in response to the 
proposal by Governor Wilson that the Central Valley Project revert to state management. Operating through its core of topographical engineers and later through its Bureau of Reclamation, the federal government literally served as the midwife of California as a modern commonwealth. The entire Far West, in fact, beginning with California, is a creation of the national will operating through water to propose that something so massive, so fundamental, as the Central Valley Project revert from reclamation to the state is to engage in an act of deconstruction and realignment, perhaps necessary, comparable to the recent disestablishment of the Soviet Union. In his lecture, Professor Esposito fully noted dangers suggested in the inaugural lecture as well by Gerald Haslam. Increasing salinity, there are no earthworms left in central California soil, Haslam suggested. The leaching of soils, the other shocks of the land through irrigation, noted through so brilliantly by Mark Reisner's book, Cadillac Desert. Paradox of paradoxes, the very tool of social redemption in William Ellsworth Smyth's phrase, the conquest of arid America, the redemption of the Great Valley, can as a matter of intrinsic functioning, or at least present day functioning, be the very same means whereby the valley is returned to something worse than desert. One thinks of those leach soils which blew into the wind onto Interstate 5 last year, perpetrating the worst traffic crash in American history. Was this a foretaste of retributions yet to come? Both Professor Sposito and Steve McCormick, Vice President and Regional Director of the Nature Conservatory of Ca Conservancy of California, sought to suggest the postponement, perhaps the ultimate conquest, of this inevitability. The great engineering system described by Dr. Sposito can, can prove the matrix, as Mr. McCormick hopes, of a delicate balance among natural habitat, agribusiness, and development in the great Central Valley. Can we reassemble the great Central Valley through water? Can we reassemble California through water? Can urban, suburban, agricultural, and conservation interests be balanced? To ask this question is by definition to ask the question, can California itself be kept viable as a concept? At the core of the California experience is a dynamic tension between two contradictory principles, nature and technology, California as wilderness, as Edenic release, and the other hand, California as built environment, cities, towns, supportive infrastructures, California as invented garden. Visiting California in the early part of the century, the Harvard philosopher George Santayana saw this tension as central to the California identity. Most Californians, Santayana pointed out, lived in urban suburban settlements around San Francisco Bay or in the Los Angeles Basin. More than 60% of the state's population, in fact, lived in the Bay Area. Yet California took as its primary symbol of identity not its cities and towns, nor even its agriculture, but its untouched, increasingly preserved wilderness. The tension, the dynamic tension suggested by Santayana threatens to become schizophrenia when the various Californias refuse to acknowledge other definitions, other Californias. Not since the first state constitutional convention in 1849 has California faced a comparable challenge to rethink itself, and the cutting edge of that is the great Central Valley, to rethink itself from first premises forward than it does in this matter of water resources allocation. What are we? What is California? Is it a wilderness, a managed, which is to say irrigated garden, or is it an urban suburban megalopolis functioning statewide as one vast built environment? Isaac Asimov's Tantalus comes to mind, the city that encompassed an entire planet in the first novel of Asimov's Foundation trilogy. In managing our water assets, in reinventing California, sheer power, sheer political numbers cannot suffice to determine the best outcome. From this perspective, sheer numbers, 
urban suburban California, developers California, wins. On the other hand, older identities, to include agriculture, cannot be given automatic renewal, despite the powerful role played by agriculture in the creation of the Golden State, the deep, deep dream of California as productive garden. Should the agricultural identity be given automatic precedence, then California as wilderness, which in modern terms means managed and conserved wilderness, and California as urban suburban settlement, will not be treated fairly. And these three elements, wilderness, urban suburban settlement, and agriculture, are from the start part of the California formula. The fact is no one entity in the tripart de facto constitution of California, agriculture, wilderness, cities, has the moral right to banish the other. The loss of any one of these entities represents the loss of California. From this perspective, it does not matter whether agriculture has been previously favored. Revenge cannot be taken, nor atonement sought, lest such revenge destroy the agricultural capacities of the state. To do this, to destroy the invented garden would represent more than the restructuring of California. It would be a moral and cultural disaster. For agriculture is one of the three separate but equal founding components of the California identity. Viewing and listening to James Houston lectures and readings of great Central Valley writers, I took the first steps towards believing that the acknowledged hegemony of the great Central Valley in producing California's best writers was perhaps but the prologue in a work of leadership in life as well as art that lay ahead for Central California. Could it be, I asked myself, that Central California, the third California to emerge after North and South, is the place where the solutions will be found and the California dream continued? The valley is a late bloomer in comparison to the coast. The Spanish barely penetrated it, and it remained largely unsettled through the Mexican era. Like the South, however, which it somewhat resembles this third California, your California, demanded an even more powerful act of imagination, of self-actualization through vision for it to emerge. Men and women had to look across vast and empty alkali plains and see homes, schools, churches, orchards, fruited plains. Long before the Central Valley Water Project was authorized by the voters during the Depression and constructed through the post-World War II era, it was envisioned in the 1870s and re-envisioned in the early 1900s through water engineering as fact and imaginative symbol. This intense requirement for imagination, this ability to see farms and towns emerging in a vast emptiness, perhaps played an important role in intensifying imagination in Central California, and thereby providing the premise for its leadership in literature, just as the defeat of the South in the Civil War intensified the imagination of the South and prompted a similar rich literary response. From this perspective, can it be that the third dream dreamt by California after the dream of the North and the South, the dream of the heartland, that is, that this third dream shall prove the most enduring because it is most fundamentally closest to the best possibilities of American civilization itself? If the 19th century was the century of Northern California, the Bay Area especially, and the 20th century, the century of Southern California, Los Angeles especially, could the 21st century be the century of the great Central Valley of Central California? Not if Central California repeats the mistakes of the other two regions. 
especially the Southland, in the matter of urban suburban sprawl and the and the at the expense of agriculture and managed wilderness. Since 1964, Gerald Haslam tells us one of our lecturers uh, reinforced this point with even more statistics. Since 1964, seven million agricultural acres have been lost to California in the Great Central Valley, and the sprawl continues, especially in, suburb in Kern County. As I suggested earlier, the economy of California grew by feeding America. In the 21st century, it could survive by feeding the world. Two centuries ago, Thomas Jefferson cautioned us that fail failure to nurture agriculture would be a betrayal of the best possibilities of America itself. The fact that agriculture in California has never successfully hosted a large population on the land, although I have to modify that belief, and some of the lectures emphasized uh, a contrary uh, uh, possibility, but this fact of agribusiness should in no way be used as an argument for the downgrading of agriculture as a component of California as a socioeconomic enterprise and perhaps even as a moral community. There is discernibly in some water circles today a thirst for revenge against agriculture. This would be a mistake. Put aside for a moment the historical identity of California as an agricultural community created through water. Look instead to the post-Cold War, post-modernist economy that awaits us, not just in this decade, but well into the 21st century. The recent suggestion made to us by Japan that we are organizing, that we are ignoring our agricultural potential cannot be too easily dismissed as an effort by the Japanese to recreate the United States as an oversized Denmark. Whatever their motivations, the Japanese, as usual, make a good point. It just may very well be that agriculture comes forth in the 21st century in terms of exported products as one of the critical elements in the new California, indeed the new American economy. When a naval orange was picked from a tree in Riverside in the 1890s and tasted by Queen Victoria in London 12 days later, California was launched into a new era an era of citrus, raisin, nut, and dried fruit exports, which surpassed the wheat exports of the 1870s and 1880s and laid down the foundations of the California economy, agricultural and urban, of the early 20th century. Agriculture, in other words, refounded California in the mid-19th century, refounded it once again at the turn of the century, and may very well come forward at the turn of this century as a building block of our new economy. Hence, those who wish to take revenge on agriculture in terms of water policy for its past excesses, or those in public office who allow unbridled license to developers and, and lose, use up valuable agricultural properties, may be weakening the very element through which we rebuild the economy of the Golden State in the 20-teens, the 2020s. And besides, why should Central California blindly repeat the disastrous sprawl of California below the Tehachapis? Was it for this that Central California emerged only after the mistakes had been made in the Southland so that it could blindly repeat those mistakes? Are the predictions of 60 million people in Central California 100 years from now prophetic inevitabilities or warnings regarding quality of life. Fresno is today the fastest growing city in the United States, but as Los Angeles proves, size isn't everything. Unless a common consciousness can emerge in Central California, a common consciousness sufficient, sufficiently strong to exercise its influence on the myriads of overlapping public jurisdictions, the Southern California experience will be repeated in Central California, repeated by many of the same developers or those like them who engineered the sprawl of the Southland, and ironically, repeated by out-migrating Southern Californians anxious to buy a little time, two or three decades at most, comparable to the time and the resources used up in Southern California in the post-World War II period. Is it Central California's fate, Gerald Haskam asked us at the beginning of this series, 
merely to be a colony of the Southland, a metastasized replicant on the northern side of the Tehachapis. To ask such a question is complicated and delicate, for growth is, the, is in the interests of in-migrating migrant, uh, minorities in Central California. As the experience of San Francisco shows, a philosophy of no growth, as opposed to proper growth, a philosophy of no growth soon yields dichotomies of Carmel and Calcutta, rich and poor. To ask the question regarding growth for, from a no growth perspective is to indulge at the, in the same social selfishness that has brought such economic devastation to some other parts of the state. On the other hand, it must be admitted that environmentalism cannot fully escape its origins as an elite activity. This was true in the, with the founding of the Sierra Club in the 1890s, and it remains true of the California Conservancy today. Only when there are sufficient resources in one's life, a job, a home, a future, does one's mind tend to turn to the long-range questions which environmentalism demands. To ask environmental questions is to postulate the reemergence of a common culture and shared value of a great central valley which is both diverse and unified. We have heard much of diversity in these lectures, but not that much concerning unity. We have heard much of the dis different ethnicities and the dozens and dozens of languages spoken in the public school. <clears throat> but what about the culture that we are all forced to assemble together? To be diverse is one thing and a good thing, but without unity comes balkanization. We should celebrate the many cultures around us. We should also seek a culture in common. In thinking about the great Central Valley, past and present, in experiencing with you these eight wonderful lectures, my mind reverted frequently to someone whom I would like to nominate as perhaps the greatest Central Californian of them all, although he basically lived in the foothills. He never told us his real name. That would have been contrary to the protocols of the Yahi people. He was born sometime around 1860, and by the early 1900s, he was the last of his tribe. On 29 August 1911, Ishii appears in the corral of a slaughterhouse just outside Oroville. Awakened by the dogs barking at Ishii, the butchers found Ishii, telephoned the sheriff in Oroville. Sheriff J.B. Weber arrives on the scene, finds Ishii emaciated, exhausted. Without violence, and as kindly as possible, Weber handcuffs the forlorn figure and drives him in his wagon to Oroville, where he locks him in his cell reserved for the insane. The sheriff was unable to determine what else to do. Ishii walked out of the Stone Age into the 20th century. Surprisingly enough, he was not intimidated. He adjusted just fine, thank you, because he had his own center of being, his own moral fulcrum, his own sense of culture with which to deal with the things that delighted him, ice cream sodas, chewing tobacco, talcum powder, and the things he found scary, like the train he took from Oroville to San Francisco a few short weeks after his emergence from the forest, believing the hissing, roaring, chugging engine to be the great demon himself. The Indian Bureau in Washington gave permission for Ishii to be released into the custody of Professors Waterman and Krober of the University of California in San Francisco. As a Native American, after all, Ishii was a ward of the government. Ishii left Oroville with Waterman on Labor Day for September 1911, arriving in San Francisco just before midnight. San Francisco would be his home for the next four years and seven months of life that remained to him. Ishii loved to communicate. From the start, while still in the Oroville jail, he had conversations with Professor Waterman, who knew a related dialect about deer hunting and making acorn soup, about how to make arrowheads, which he then demonstrated. For his remaining four plus years among the white men, Ishii never stopped communicating. He had as much to tell the white men as they had to tell him. In fact, he had, in many ways, more to tell them. 
He seemed to take their culture with a grain of salt, although he liked many of its best points, while at the same time doing everything possible, making every effort to communicate the culture, the culture which had kept him alive in some 40 plus years of hidden existence. Ishii takes his place alongside the other great Native Americans, Squanto, Pocahontas, Chief Logan, Sacagawea, Sequoia, who approach the white man, not consciously or deliberately, but effectively nevertheless, from the angle of moral superiority. Native Americans who seem to be sent to the white people to teach them better ways to heal the sickness at the root of their being. From this perspective, Ishii is perhaps the greatest teacher of them all, greater than Squanto, who fed the pilgrims, or Pocahontas, who was willing to sacrifice her life for an Englishman, or Sacagawea, who led the Americans, Lewis and Clark, to the Pacific. Ishii was teaching a lesson that only now is being recognized, the lesson of culture and identity, the lesson of shared human value. Ishii's culture was transmitted to him intact by the half dozen or so adults who had survived the slaughter. Yet the culture was transmitted in a powerful way. Ishii knew the stories of his people. He knew the tool making techniques of his people. He could fashion bows and arrows and hunt with them effectively. He knew the forest and the animals. More importantly, he had absorbed from his culture this destroyed, devastated culture, a sense of well-being of psychic wholeness and integration that would have cast credit on an infinitely more complex culture. And coming from a few survivors hidden in a northern California forest seemed nothing less than a miracle. No, something more, a testimony to the fundamental power of culture as a mechanism, as an idea, as a source of good behavior, well-being, and social decision. Shared culture. Was Ishii the last of the first Californians? Or was he a prototype of a California yet to be, a California harmonizing nature and culture, living in balance and at peace with itself? This, after all, peace, dignity, a creative connection with the environment, an equally creative connection with the best of human culture, have been the goals of those who forged the great Central Valley aesthetic in the turn of the century period, at the very moment when Ishii first emerged into Oroville. To glimpse Central California as Ishii saw it had been the implicit goal of so many Californians in the turn of the century period. Ishii, in other words, must be linked with his contemporaries, George Wharton James, Mary Austin, William Ellsworth Smythe, John Muir, Jack London, Robinson Jeffers, David Starr Jordan, and all the others, as one of the number of, of turn-of-the-century pilgrims and protagonists of California, most noticeably Central California, as a better place, a more peaceful and responsible place. Ishii then has a message for the great Central Valley. Ishii embodies the power of culture, and that to me was what all these lectures finally came to culture triumphant, culture when functioning well, culture as moral meaning, and also culture when absent, uh, the lack of culture, and, and the, the terrible things that happened then. Ishii survived and remained fully human because he possessed both his cultural and identity, the same culture and identity which awaits discovery, reassemblage in the great Central Valley in the 21st century. Ishii has a message for the great Central Valley on whose edge he passed most of his life. Only a shared culture can see us through. Only by living in harmony with ourselves, with our fellow human beings, with our society, and with our environment can we become fully human. Ishii's world was simple in, a, in external circumstance, yet rich in interior identities. Our world is rich in external circumstances, yet seeks and seeks new inner meanings. Malcolm Margolin suggested the more porous identities of the indigenous peoples of the great Central Valley. Past and present, after all, are not that far apart. Ishii, for all his simplicity, 
provides the paradigm of a usable past. Unless we come to terms with who we are in the context of who we are together, we shall never, like Ishii, be always coming home. Thank you very much. Well, one of, the, one of the paradoxes is for, the, for development in Central California, in the Great Central Valley, to have confidence in the opposing but complementary principle of urbanism. If we take urbanism slash suburbanism, but especially urbanism, San Francisco, after all, was the 10th largest city in the United States by 1870. And if we take that parallel to agriculture, which is part of California from the start, managed wilderness, as I, as, as I suggested, it is paradoxically in a love of cities with their dense use of property that we avoid the sprawl of Southern California. Southern California went wrong, in my opinion, but for various reasons, because some of them are deeply historical. American cities have always been, had a tendency to spread out at the edges. Southern California lost its faith in, its, in, in urbanism. To take a look at downtown Los Angeles in the 19-teens and 20s is to see, uh, when serviced by the interurban electrics, is to see a, a classic urban region into which 50,000 people came and moved and worked. Walk along Broadway today in Southern in Los Angeles and you see those buildings from that era. Uh, by the 1950s, of course, that had been left behind and Los Angeles was spreading, spreading, spreading. I have no uh, 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 objection to Fresno moving, uh, to developing. That's Fresno's business, free choice. America's a free choice market. But if, if Fresno has confidence in itself as a city, then let it be a city, not a sprawling suburb. Let it have apartment buildings. Let it have high rises. Let it make intense use of smaller portions of land. Let it be a city and not eat up its adjacent agricultural regions. There's no reason whatsoever that urban, intense urban environments can't subsist side by side with agricultural regions as they, had in, as they have in Europe for centuries, for a thousand years. Uh, it's the suburb, it's the sprawl, it's the eating up of acre after acre after acre in the most minimal possible use as if land were infinite uh, that, that creates the problem, not cities. Great classic cities, Athens, Rome, Paris, London, no, Tokyo, no, those are exceptions, those are sprawling cities, but so many of the great clients, Vienna, are cities that make intense use of what they have. I was delighted coming into Modesto to see, probably something very controversial, to see that red lion inn rising up over the skyline, <laughs> because I can just imagine how many of the beautiful orchards that I also saw coming in here it would have taken uh, to uh, create the same amount of square footage in a horizontal manner. Sir? Yeah, I, do you see some changes, though, that 
are going to have to happen. I mean, right now, I have a friend who went out over here and bought about six houses, and or was in the process of buying six houses. So I'll be back tomorrow, hoping to make a better deal. <coughs> the next day, he came back and he says, you know, I think I'll go ahead. I'll give you the same amount of money as we talked about yesterday. I said they're all sold. He says there's not enough people in Modesto that could buy that the houses. He says there's nobody from Modesto who bought them. They're all from the Bay Area. I remember, and I think it's in the Inventing the Dream, where you talked about um, Venice down in Cape, when he was make, trying to make the deals with Huntington in order to get the line out, out to, the, uh, to his city. He was, he was losing money on the in the process. And it wasn't until we had some type of cheap transportation that we began to see that sprawl. Well, I must admit that as, as my wife and I drove in today, this afternoon from San Francisco, and came off the interstate and came down to these lovely orchards and valleys, looked at this lush agricultural area, saw the incredible self-regard that the homes uh, exemplified. Didn't see one piece of graffiti that we were talking about moving here ourselves. <laughs> In other words, uh, you, can't, you can't have Falstaff and have him lean. You can't achieve a quality of life here and not expect it to attract people. And we don't want to be that way. But we must manage it correctly. We must manage it correctly, and that's why I use the metaphor of urbanization. Los Angeles, for instance, is going to have to spend the next 100 years, and its subway system is just the beginning, re-intensifying itself back around that city which it so heedlessly squandered uh, 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as uh, born and raised here through the 30s, I remember the problems you mentioned of the migrants. But you're the first person who's had a kind word to say for what the locals have been. It seems that everybody has read the grapes of wrath and, and, and thinks we're a bunch of heathens. Well, I'm probably the first person. Thank you. I'm probably the first person maybe who went through the archives and just didn't repeat what Steinbeck said. Now, let me very carefully. Steinbeck, I don't need this, do I? Steinbeck had the, I do need it. Steinbeck had the right artistically to shape his narrative and select it. But he did that at the expense of ignoring the outreach which I'm talking about, the, the willingness, for instance, of so many of the agricultural communities in the Central Valley to double, triple, quadruple their taxes, to build new schools and hospitals, to set up wards for uh, migrant children and, and nursing and uh, pregnant mothers, et cetera, to, ha to have their children. I know this because I went through the records of the Bancroft Library and see these things. Now Steinbeck eliminated that for artistic purposes, but he wasn't telling the story. When the story is told, there has to be both sides of it. The idea that, that the migrants encountered a universal blank stare, a stare of hostility, is just not the case. It's not borne out by the records. And um, Thank you. it was a great, really, injustice for, for artistic purposes, and injustice was done to the actual historical record. The problem is, and this has attached itself to that novel, which is a great novel, it's attached itself to that novel uh, so long, the problem is that people see that novel as documentary history. It's done in a documentary style, but Steinbeck, sh if he was going to be totally documentarian, should have done a chapter on all those public health nervous nurses that went out and tried to uh, work with, 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 the, with, with the sick children. Anyway, my new book, I'll Try and Do This, it won't have the power of Steinbeck's story, but at least it'll try and set the record more completely uh, uh, forward. So getting back to, uh, to your uh, suggestions for urbanization, we have, of course, tried to make Modesto denser uh, uh, consciously. Uh, are you also suggesting that if we build, build a better transportation system from the Bay Area, that that might help us? Or are you talking about an internal system here? No. And also, you have suggestions about how to make this process more possible when the developers have all the dollars. <laughs> well, you have all the votes. Oh. All the votes in the world. All the votes in the world aren't. Uh, uh, all the dollars in the world aren't worth the votes. A number of things. Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright once envisioned in the 1930s, in fact, he spent most of the 30s working on Broad Acre City, which was a dispersion, right, right forecast, modern technology, telecommunications, the facts, trans all the various things that today make urban life possible outside an urban setting. 
If I wake up in the morning in Santa Fe, New Mexico, or Modesto, California, and I deal in stocks, and I access through my computer and modem uh, a stock market in Los Angeles, or San Francisco, where am I in terms of what city I'm living in? I'm living in Los Angeles or, or, or uh, San Francisco. In other words, we already have enormously disper dispersed urban uh, communities uh, existing. People who make their living, their livelihood out of Los Angeles live in, Sa live in Aspen, Colorado, live in Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, if they only have to come in so many times. I'm talking now by a more privileged elite, but there's a model of what, what the future holds. So the fact is that you can have now density and dispersion without sprawl, uh, because it, sprawl is not necessary economically. It's not necessary to, to, to have sprawl economically today. You don't have to metastasize out over culture, because people will be making their living uh, in part electronically through enormous amounts of exchanges, which don't demand that they spatially be where they're working. Great uh, credit card companies, credit card companies have already discussed this with their offloading of so many of their processes to North and South Dakota, to Las Vegas. Uh, they call it the lakes. They won't let it say Las Vegas because that, that particular credit card company doesn't want to be identified with gambling. <laughs> so, so the point, the point is, is that you have in cities like like Modesto the possibilities of high urbanism in terms of that which is available to you in terms of entertainment, in terms of uh, accessing uh, 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 art, music, in terms of uh, doing business anywhere you want without having to replicate the absolute physical structure of what constitutes a city. Fresno may get bigger and bigger and actually get more suburban and lose some of that wonderful urbanism that Fresno has always had, that we read about in Saroyan and that I experienced in the 1950s when I used to hang out with so many Fresno kids working up at Yosemite National Park. So I, I, I wouldn't be in any uh, rush to think that sprawl is an, that, a, that an economically di uh, driven sprawl is necessary. It's I'm asking you, how do you prevent it? Not that it's yeah. necessary. Well, are you active politically? Do you? Bad. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, we had a, you, you, you look like and see and sound like somebody who's prevented quite a few things already. <laughs> We had a vote on preserving the agricultural land, and the, and the agricultural community was dead set against it. It was us urbanized who were trying to save the, that good land. Well, you're doing the right thing. As I suggest, all that asphalt in the 21st century uh, may, may, may not be the, re the, the way the California economy or the American economy recycles itself. It just may be that in the year 2020, 2030, 2040, the United States of America is once again a preeminent agricultural power. The quality of life, for instance, that obtained up and down this state that I try to suggest in my um, Inventing the Dream, one of my, my discussion of California agriculture, the, co the quality of life that obtained at the high moment, say, of the citrus culture, 1890, 1920, uh, is, 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 uh, is something that we, we look back today with nostalgia. I'm not sentimentalizing. I'm not talking about the hard work. I'm not talking about the low wages, all the things I'm willing to acknowledge, and yet people had a, 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 a healthy life. Now, am I a pastoralist? Do I think we should all go back to uh, agriculture? No, but don't let them squander the future, squander the fact that this may be the building block of our new economic identity. What else are we going to be doing here in this state? We were agricultural from the beginning. We maintain to this moment, to this day, our agricultural preeminence in the country. What else, what should we abandon that for? Money. Yeah. Developers. I have a comment over, or a question over here. Yeah, during your whole lecture, you got cold. Uh, people seem to forget that this country, and I've been history myself, is the history of guns and greed. This place was stolen by powers that came into it. And I don't think, unfortunately, the advanced spirit, you have to change the advanced spirit to change his urbanization or his colonization or anything he does. And I think our problem is the people, whether it's California or I've been all over this country, uh, all the states are going through this now. Uh, the destruction of our natural resources is the greed. Man is motivated by greed. And it's that simple. You're not going to be able to stop these developers uh, if they get their eyes on a hunk of land. Uh, a friend of mine uh, has a piece of property over in Hawaii, and uh, the Japanese came in, foreign investors, and they bought a, a 
we bought the golf course. That, you know, Tim, a dollar bill is, is, is our new gun. And, and you're just you're describing this as an inevitable process. I, I, that's all I've seen all my life. I well, we better roll back. We better we better roll back and uh, uh, history and tell all those uh, American figures like Jane Addams and Hull House, like Josiah Royce formulating his philosophy, like Henry George worrying about the redemption of the urban poor. <laughs> like Abraham Lincoln uh, embodying the agony and torment of the divided republic, uh, Julia Ward Howe. Uh, we all better tell all those triumphant figures, Dorothy Day, that they were all mistaken, that they wasted their time, that the buck is the only thing, that American civilization didn't have to be struggled for. We don't need Henry James. We don't need the paintings, uh, the sculptures, uh, the great architecture. Uh, the simple moments. We don't need Thornton Wilder's Our Town, William Ng's Blood in the Grass. Let's just talk about money. Your point is valid, but it's only part of the point. Only part of the point. Otherwise, the civilization would have long since uh, turned into something other than it is. Um, and it's not as bleak as, as you suggested at all points. They see, there's another way of looking at, at California, Central California, saying the miracle is, given all the bad things that are out there, given the forces that you've described so effectively, guns and greed, et cetera, the miracle is that we're not in a worse condition, that there isn't. Uh, the man you talked about, and others. OK, well, then you and I agree. You're emphasizing. No, I understand. No, 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 no. I'm taking you as a point, not yourself personally. You're right, but I'm also right. I've been naive all my life. I've always identified with uh, uh, those who try to make the world a little better. I'm writing my history of California, for instance. I've tried to gather together in these books, the third, fourth volume I just finished. Uh, I got some wonderful villains, too, whom I love, like Artie Samish, for instance, uh, <laughs> the great lobbyist. You can't help but like him. Uh, the chutzpah of taking a, a, a ventriloquist dummy and putting it on his lap and calling it Mr. Legislature and uh, posing for Saturday Evening Post magazine. But at the same time, I've tried to identify with those master spirits and those uh, more subtly, sometimes anonymous, workers for the good, which characterize our culture. It, coming into a city like this and reading it from the outside, to repeat myself, to see the well-ordered streets, the beautifully planted gardens, the lack of graffiti, and I say that again and again because I'm from Southern California, uh, is to say that something is going on here. Some level of self-esteem, shared cultural value is here. Otherwise, the place would look like uh, where I teach, outside where I teach. Pardon me? I will. I will, and I, I will. I will. Um, this sort of ties into what you're saying, and perhaps you can answer it in your speeches in another way. As a practical public policy approach, how do we avoid losing the Central Valley a short-sighted market to veil. In other words, you know, can you make some practical suggestions that we need as a Well, th that's that question of, sh I tried to end my, isn't it naive the way I ended the complexity by focusing on this question of shared cultural value and to see the power of culture, of shared value, in what should have been the most fragile person of all Calif Central California history, the last of his tribe. They, when he was a boy, there were 3,000 Yahi. And because of the guns that you talked about and the greed, by the time he was 40, he was the last one. Yet he didn't have a nervous breakdown. He didn't get bitter. He prevailed. He still had the capacity to identify with the good. And uh, shared cultural value. When and if the great Central Valley, and I think Gerald Haslam is on a cutting edge of this, of this realizes collectively what it has, prepares to take a leadership position in the state, in, in politics, and in development policy, the same way that it already has in water policy and literature, there's the, there's the beginning. There's the beginning of the corrective action. Uh, as long as it falls victim <coughs> to sectors of the society, which I think have just absolutely have no moral uh, presence, and I'm not some radical, huh? I mean, I took my wax. I'm a nice conservative Harry Truman Democrat. Uh, but it pays attention to, to, to those that have done things to Southern California, which have totally obscured the dream, the poetry of Southern California life, which was so exquisite in through the 1930s and 40s. To let them come here and do that all over again, uh, if it happens, uh, then possibly uh, there is no shared value here, no sense of what, what the civic 
what the total civic and regional culture means. No, it's not small. You can, you can move, for instance, it's a very common planning concept. We don't follow it much in this country. You can move through fingers of development, fingers of development that thread their way through agricultural properties uh, using marginal properties and, uh, as opposed to metastasizing along the landscape. I agree that there has to be extension, but extension is not necessarily sprawl. Sprawl can occur in very cunning, managed ways. I'm from the east and I returned to the east. I've only been here for a few months. I've learned a great deal about this valley. Um, but I also feel a real division that comes along with the Sierras, and that California is one state and there are 49 others. And sometimes I feel that out here, that people came out here in order to be out here in a way. Okay? And my concern really is what. How do we bridge that gap? How, how are there things back there that are important here that are being ignored? Is there something from the east that is being overlooked as people come out here? Are there things that those of us in the east should really understand and everybody needs to understand about the importance of California? Not just to California, but to the United States, too, to the rest of us. So we're not dividing constantly. I feel this. When I read the papers here, and I feel when I hear people talk about their problems here, I also wonder, do you realize what's happening when there are whole hosts of people that have gone unemployed in the, you know, the, 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 the Northeast died with the manufacturing. That's part of us. We belong together, too. And I wonder what, what we might have to share across the border. Well, we're, you're living, first, there's a number of things that your, your comments bring to mind. First of all, historically, you're absolutely right. California is a creation of the national will. It was the United States Corps of Topographical uh, Engineers that explored the West, Pacific Railroad reports, uh, like, like Senator Hayakawa, the late Senator Hayakawa said about the Panama Canal, why we should keep it. Uh, California became American because we stole it fair and square, right? We, we, <laughs> The United States federal government, operating through the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, seized California. To make no apologies, and this was an act of war. We were governed by the federal establishment. Senior, the senior Army or Navy officer in California was, by de definition, the governor from 1846 to 50 until the establishment of, until General Percival Smith became uneasy about governing civilians. At the same time I say this, however, uh, the period right after, from 1850 through the 1890s, early 1900s, California was a self-governing dominion. In fact, Joseph Ellison wrote a very classic book on this uh, topic under that name, California's Self-Governing Dominion. Uh, a dominion linked through its urban structures, for instance, were having as much in common through its steamers crossing the Pacific with Melbourne, Sydney, Hong Kong, Yokohama, as it did with New York or, or Washington, D.C. And don't forget uh, as well that so much of what you call the nation now didn't exist in the 19th century, that, some, that American civilization in 1846 had barely tippy-toed over the Alleghenies. Chicago was a small frontier fort. There was no Omaha. There was no Denver. Uh, the entire urban, uh, the Sunbelt cities of the Southwest, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Houston, didn't exist. Dallas was just a little fort, et cetera. So in other words, California grew historically in the 19th century in ways that had as much in common with the rise of New Zealand. And if you go to New Zealand, you can see the cost comparisons are very dramatic between California and New Zealand. When we wanted to establish our water policy, for instance, we didn't go to the East Coast. Now, our water policy is the fundamental means of which we defined ourselves. We didn't go to the East Coast. There was no analogy there for water policy that vast. We went to Australia. We brought the 
We brought the consultants up from Australia in the 1880s to advise us as, as to how their irrigation-based society uh, did it. Now, because we were Pacific-oriented, sealed off by the Sierra Nevada, uh, self-governing, does that mean we're any less American? No, our place was here. America was here with us. The United States was here with us. Now, as to whether or not we have a difficulty assimilating the national experience, we're doing something very powerful for the United States in trying to assimilate new peoples to American circumstances. I think that's so important for the rest of the country to, to get involved with and be realized. I don't think California should have to bear that whole expense even that's involved with that. Well, people like to come here. People like to come to California. Americans, all the statistics about migration into California throughout the eight lectures was to me incredibly comforting. People like to come here, and as long as they're coming here, that's a tremendous vote of, of, of confidence. But anyway, to get back to this point, we're doing this work of assimilation, not for ourselves, but for, for, not exclusively for ourselves, but for the nation itself. We're best equipped to handle it. You can only absorb so many people into rural New Hampshire. Massachusetts can only take so many more people. They, Massachusetts is a state that very much has been extended its hand to the, to the immigrant. Even New York, the Empire State, which has always been on the cutting edge after we, we took our state constitution from New York in 1850, even New York confesses now exhaustion at, at the ability to assimilate and transform new peoples. So it remains our work and the work of other Sunbelt cultures, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, uh, to, to, to play a part. Uh, the East Coast is not part of what's forming up now, although it eventually will be, along the entire border between the United, Mexico and the United States, extending from San Diego slash Tijuana all the way to the Gulf of California, is growing up an urbanized, bicultural, bi-sovereign uh, uh, string of metropolises down which the middle of which runs a border. Uh, that is at one time the greatest barrier of all, Another, on the other hand, is not a barrier at all. 50,000 people a week legally cross the border in, uh, from, uh, from Mexico from, through, into San Diego to go to dinner, to see a show, to watch the Padres, and they go home. They're not swimming across, they're not sneaking across. There's a whole new, uh, there's a whole new civilization, a whole new diplomacy that's being achieved along the Sun Belt that just puts America California and the Southwest at the cutting edge of that. The East did its work spectacularly, it drafted the Constitution, gave us the framework that, lasts, that has lasted for 200 years, provides us with the formal intellectual culture, magazines, newspapers, the work of commentary that still dominates us. California is smart enough, but uh, <laughs> prefers to go to the beach as much as it does to read a book. <laughs> So, so I see a great synergy. I think what's important, for, what's important to realize is that California is a creation of the national will, and today, and historically and today, has always functioned as a cutting edge experiment for the rest of the nation, for better or for worse. I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Ford for his pleasure, and I'd like to ask you to join me in the Thank you. Thank you.